Beaverton, like many small communities, holds its fair share of historical treasures. The Beaver River winds its way through the center of town and alongside the shores of the Beaverton Thora Eldon Historical Society before it empties into the Beaverton Harbor. The steamships and leisurely canoeists of the late 1800s have long been replaced by jet skis and cabin cruisers, and like many towns, its history fades like an old photograph, its preservation left to a box of snapshots or recanted tales. Uptown, at the corner of Main Street and Mirror Road, sits another piece of local history, the Strand Theatre, owned and operated by Gladys and Vernon Flaherty. The significance of this theatre could be attributed to the fact that it is one of the few community movie theatres in this area still in existence, in an age of videos, DVDs and monster cinemas. But through the old doors of the lobby, a glass case holds a major artifact of Canadian history, the kinetoscope, one of the first movie projectors created by Thomas Edison. thousand feet. Each, each uh, section was a, it's a 50 foot uh, reel. Uh, each subject, I mean, there's, there's uh, tw uh, 20 titles and 16 of them are the only ones in existence in the world. And they were uh, stored in Beaverton here in the basement. Uh, the White's house, and uh, they were in sealed cans, and that's the, how they were preserved. As long normally, uh, their nitrate filament would have all deteriorated, but uh, it was shown in, in April eighth, eighteen ninety seven. They were first shown in Beaverton. The one minute soundless films were first shown on the kinetoscope at the Alexandria Hall. The theatre was established in 1897 above Maxine's and the former Beaverton Hotel. There was a period after 1925 when motion pictures were viewed at the Methodist Church on Main Street. Walter King and his wife who ran it, the show, and they had a player piano there, and his wife used to play the different roles, a lot of Susan's marches, and uh, they were quite rousing, and, and the children would stamp their feet. She would stop playing, come down, and call for order, and go back. <laughs> I think I was only in that theater once, and I was over here because there wasn't enough work for me on the island, so I got shipped back and forth in the summertime. And it cost one dollar at that time, and I might have been 12 years old, uh, for my Aunt Babe and I to get in. And I don't know what we saw, but there was some film. And my aunt knew all about it. She knew there, were going to be, there was going to be a show there that night. Because uh, a youngster uh, of 12 years old, I wasn't in, interested in anything like that at all. Uh, but, uh, however, she took me and away we went. And that's the only time I was in there. But that's where the local films were shown when I was 12 years old. In 1940, Jack Grills started the first permanent theater in Beaverton, above the old Hartmere's where Petals is now located, with Walter King as projectionist. In 1947, Brian Flaherty came to Beaverton and took over the picture show. His brother Vernon Flaherty joined him in 1948. Ran the best pictures that were produced around the world in eighty days. They yeah. never replayed that extensively. Gone with the wind, and greatest show on earth, and westerns. If you didn't play a western on a Saturday night, everybody would be upset. The Strand Theater at the corner of Main Street and Mare Road was built by Gladys Flaherty's father. Gladys's father and uh, my and an uncle. Mac King, and we built this. This is for originally for 400 seats, and it's built in such a way that we can double the size of it by moving that back wall out and still keep the show running. Uh, 
to make it in about an 800 seat theater. The grand opening was held on August 15, 1955. The first movie I ever saw at the New Strand Theater was a movie called The Dam Busters with Richard Todd. I just have very fond recollections of that, of the old theater and the new one. And, uh, as a kid, uh, the two things in Beaverton I loved the most was going to see the trains when they went by and also to go to the show. When the Strand Theater was built, Vernon Flaherty was unaware of the artifact that would find a home in his community theater. Thomas Edison produced the new and improved Kinetoscope in 1897, which found its way into the hands of a Mr. William A. White and G. Warder while living in Hancock, Michigan. The projector was then stored in the home of Georgia White, or Babe as she was known, and her niece Bessie and husband Jack Palmer. James White recalls the camera. When our youngsters were small, my uncle Jack Palmer used to uh, show them a picture or two in the hall upstairs of the Red Brick House down on Main Street. And uh, I don't know why me and I were never involved with the, all our, their cousins, our nieces and nephews from uh, Uncle Jack's family all went upstairs. They knew what was going to happen and uh, they sat down on the floor and Uncle Jack would run two or three reels and that was the highlight of the time. It generally came at the fall fair time too. While house painting for Vernon Flaherty, Jack Palmer offered him the kinetoscope. Jack Palmer came, came along and says, I'm going to run opposition to you. And I said, well, I, he says, I got a projector down there. So he took a look at it. He said, you better take it because the rest of the family aren't interested in it. In those days, to see movies, something moving across the screen, they had peep shows before this. This was the first that projected an image on a screen, big wide screen. Robert Gooderidge is the author of Magic Moments, first 20 years of movie pictures in Toronto. During a centennial celebration, Mr. Gooderidge shared his research at a presentation at the Strand Theatre. Uh, this Edison projecting kinetoscope was one of Thomas Edison's second model projecting machine, which was made available on the open market in February, uh, late uh, February of uh, 1897. Uh, William A. White and a Mr. Warder brought this particular machine to Beaverton from Hanock, Michigan sometime in 1897, which of course would have to be after February since that's when the machine was available. After showing uh, in the state of Michigan how long they used it there, I'm not aware of. This is one of the few surviving um, Edison early projecting kinetoscopes in existence that is so complete. There are some which are have the what we call the head, that's the um, driving mechanism, that exists in various uh, private collections. But not only that, the films as well, uh, plus all sorts of um, uh, accoutrements that um, make this machine uh, a wonderful collection. Now, according to Vernon, Bess, the niece, recalled to him that as a child of around eight. William White brought the machine to Thora Island um, and set it up in the cottage kitchen and projected the films onto a sheet uh, which was in the living room. She recalls that as a young child. Now what is remarkable is the fact that these 20 films were preserved in their original sealed cans along with the projector in the White's basement for so many years. Now some of you may be aware that all of these films were printed on what we call a nitrate base. And nitrate base deteriorates when exposed uh, for a long period of time uh, and certain conditions and just simply turns to a brown powder. Now, because of, I guess, the conditions in the basement and the fact that they were kept in these sealed cans, the films were perfectly preserved, which is amazing in itself. So not only do we have a projector of rare existence, but the films as well. The Butterfly Dance was the only one of 20 original titles to be colorized. Brian Flaherty's son, David Flaherty, was instrumental in restoring the film. I 
uh, while I was in university, I began a research project that would kind of dig in hard to uh, explore the background and where they were from and what was the importance of these films. Um, that project is an ongoing one, let's just say, and 20 some years later, um, I'm kind of still at it in a way. The archives were very quick in taking an interest in the work that was going on um, and began a very arduous process of literally reproducing, which meant re-photographing frame by frame these films. The aim being not to make any improvement whatsoever, but to recreate what would have been shown at that time. Uh, so literally re-photographing each individual frame. Um, and it involved a lot of work and retooling of sprockets to fit very shrunken, a little bit brittle, uh, old film, difficult to work with. The magic was, by 1982, there was a film that you could project and see just what these films had been, and we were most impressed. Uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York decided to assemble all of the films they possibly could from 1895, made from, excuse me, 1895 to 1900. Uh, and it was, in the end, quite a massive collection, Canada's contribution being um, the collection that's at the Strand Theatre now. Uh, and it was wonderful to see it and uh, it was a very well attended and quite an interesting showing hope to uh, produce kind of a, a dramatic documentary that would explain uh, the importance of the Edison films and um, how they how they came to Canada how it all how it all happened and, and perhaps help help with a better understanding of that period everyone who saw these films would have been seeing a moving image on a screen for literally the first time we're uh, pretty blasé about all of this kind of stuff in our media-savvy world. Uh, but this was literally a chance to go and see the world on your own doorstep. Today's films are a far cry from the 60-second classics displayed on Edison's invention. That's what they call a, a full reel is a thousand feet. And these are 2,000 foot reels. So the average movie runs five or six reels on a thousand feet and, and it's run through the machine at 24 frames a second. This is pretty well still what the, the mechanism has never really changed. And instead of these arc lights, the arc lights are the brightest light men can make right now and uh, they use Xeon lights which were or a, a, just a, a bright bow, and then your, your film shredded up here in the top, and the tape up in the bottom. Sound systems have improved considerably since Edison's time. This is optical sound. There's an exciter lamp here that uh, shows a beam of light through onto your soundtrack, and it's picked up here and uh, it goes through the amplifier and down into the speaker. These are sh fire shutters. That's, you don't model them anymore. What does the future hold for the Strand Theatre? Can it survive in an age of monster cinemas and Omnimax? I'm sure everybody would always hope that Beaverton would have 
it's a fine fine theater showing you know the best of, of movies um, it depends on an audience and uh, we'll hope that people continue to go then the television came in and, and the movie movie people will go crazy when something new comes along they turn their back on the bread and butter and they were putting newer and newer pictures on, on television and, and then the, finally that kind of wore off and this has picked up and it started to get really good again and then they came up with a VCR and that was it that really killed it that's when a lot of theaters closed up and you just couldn't operate well patrons of the super cinemas have the fond recollection strand moviegoers recall uh, one of the aspects there I'd never seen in a show before they had what I guess what they call a cry room there for women with their young children that if they start to cry they can go in a glass area and still watch the movie and listen to the sound without disturbing any of the other patrons that are in there. And I um, remember that when the theater opened I tried to go to every movie that ever was there. Anyway, Mrs. Howe, she, she would come and sit usually in the back row and on the way out she said to me one day, my dear, something terrible has happened. And I said, what's the problem? Well, you know, I got excited. And when I get excited in the movie, I take my teeth out and I wrap them all up and I put them on my lap. And she said, I've lost them. Now, if you can find them, if you can find them, even if they're in a thousand pieces, would you please get them for me? And I said, yes, I'll do that. Sure, Mrs. So. Anyway, we looked all over, looked all over, and I couldn't find them. The next day, I called her and I said, I'm sorry, but I, I can't find your teeth, Mrs. Howe. Oh, my dear, it's all right. They're home in a cup. <laughs> Sometimes we have fun there, like real fun, and we like yell. And we watch movies. And yeah, we watch the good movies there. I don't really like the big cinemas because it gets too crowded. Yeah, the big theaters are okay, but the Strand, it's ours. I like the Strand theater because when I go there, I can get together with all my friends. And at the um, big theaters, I can't. The day after tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. the day after tomorrow is probably the best. American Pie Wedding. Peter Pan. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe in fairies. <laughs>